Good morning, everybody, all over the world from The Hague, the Netherlands. Welcome into this very empty and very beautiful studio. I would definitely prefer you to be here with us today, but these challenging times don't make this possible. So it's great to have so many people that can join who wouldn't have been able to join otherwise. And yes, you, the audience, you will be able to engage with us in this meeting by sending your ideas and questions. And please use the Ask the Speaker button on your screen. We'd truly love to hear from you. The session today is about a very important topic, the circular economy and national climate plans, the so-called NDCs. This stands for the National Nationally Determined Contributions. So it's the response of countries to the climate crisis. And the circular economy plays a very strong role in this. The circular economy is called a missing puzzle piece, as the Dutch Minister for Environment often says, to realize our shared climate ambition and to reach climate neutrality by 2050. That is why it is so important that we put these ambitions into actions. And if we are on track or not, and what can be done more, this we will discuss today with five leading partners and organizations. So welcome Gloria from UNDP, Charles from UNEP, Kenichi Katamura from the United Nations Climate Change Team, UNFCCC, Rob Bradley joining us from the US, thanks for getting up very early, from the NDC Partnership, and Zainat from the Development Alternatives Group, an NGO working out of India. Thanks to all of you and thanks for sharing the time together. And before we come to you, I want to say hello to my friend, the colleague artist, uh, Vera, who is in the studio today with us. Hello. hello, Vera. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Fantastic. She will, as a visual artist today, capture here the red thread, the main questions and commitments that are emerging for action from our discussion. So thanks. And I'll get back to you a bit later. And before we start the discussion here in the studio, and in case you have missed the highlights from yesterday, here is a short clip summarizing some of the main takeaways of the WCEF, the World Circular Economy Forum, here in the Netherlands. We urge all parties, especially major emitters, to look at how, in the coming months, they can increase their ambition and reflect this in new or revised NDCs. We simply cannot afford further delay or our current pathway. The circular economy plays a definite role here. It must expand if we are to reduce emissions across sectors, as it is an essential component to achieving climate neutrality. We are far behind in terms of where science has been telling us we need to be, but the United Nations family is, if you want, the connective tissue amongst very different countries. We are obviously working very closely together with UNEP to bring the circular economy and um, sustainable consumption production thinking into these national climate strategies. In Ghana, for example, we have been working with the e-waste issue, which is a huge thing. Today, 95% of all electronic and electrical waste, much of it from Europe, is collected and uh, in the recycling and circularity. We need to get much better at that and we need to stop exporting our waste to poor countries. That's a part of our to-do plan. Circularity starts with our own households. We have to educate our people on the importance to the environment, importance to their health, but more fundamentally to their livelihood. In Chile, through the implementation of circular economy roadmap, we have a goal to generate 180,000 new green jobs in the booming recycle industry, which is essential in the context of a green recovery after this pandemic. The NDCs, I think, are the right instrument. The NDCs is where we, we all put our policy goals together uh, in a coherent approach that aims to, to, um, to meet the societal development goals, mm -hmm. sustainable development goals. Um, and so we need to connect policymakers, we need to connect policymakers and companies, financial institutions, we have to bring that all together and we have to share our best practices and work together to get this ball rolling mm -hmm. ever more quickly because we are running out of time. 
It's obviously great to see so much commitment for the circular economy and what it can bring. At the other hand, we all know we have to be careful not to be sunk in a bubble and forget what is really happening out there. So a quick reality check. And before looking at the specific opportunities the circular economy can offer to close the emissions gap, let us look at the current state of national climate plans. We all heard that in the news in the recent weeks, despite more countries showing more ambition, the plans communicated are still falling short of where we want to be. And we thought, and we want to bring you in here, we not want to know what you are thinking uh, about the current state. By how many degrees, dear audience, will the global temperature rise if all existing national climate plans are actually fully implemented as currently planned? Please use the poll that you are seeing online, and we're going to get to the uh, results in a second. And as we are waiting for this, Kenichi, how does the situation look like? Asking this, you also, because your boss, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, called the findings of an interim report you recently launched a red alert for our planet. Yes. Basically, the report found a huge gap between the current level of government commitments in NDCs and the required level of emissions cut to achieve the Paris Agreement goal. Five years ago, the governments adopted the Paris Agreement with a goal to limit the temperature rise well below 2 degrees Celsius level and pursuing efforts to limit 1.5 degrees Celsius level. And in order to achieve this 1.5 degree target, we need to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030 from 2010 levels and reach net zero by 2050. But the report found the level of emissions will be just 0.5% lower in 2030 from 2010 levels. And this is the assessment based on NDCs from 75 governments who represent 30% of global emissions. And we will publish the final version of the report covering more NDCs before the COP26 this year, scheduled in November. But this initial finding is clearly a red alert for our planet. Because unless governments around the world collectively reduce emissions far deeper than the current levels, the world will experience the temperature rise far beyond 2 degrees Celsius level, and where we will face more severe drought, heat wave, hurricane, to name a few. Back to you, Harold. Thanks, Kenichi. And we're just getting in the uh, poll results. And indeed, the, uh, what we are currently looking at, we're looking at with the current scenario at a three degree potential warming of the planet. And as I see here in the result that is coming in, majority of you was thinking that it would be 2.5 degrees. But I think there's an emerging realization of the majority of the population that we are still falling behind where we should go. And I think this gap, that we are seeing between what is said and what is actually happening is motivating many of us to work on a day-to-day -day basis for climate action. And Charlie, good to see you again. You work for the United Nations top environment agency, UNEP, in the emissions gap report that you guys are showing the problem again and pathways on the way forward. And you're talking about missing an opportunity to limit global warming. On what pathway are we Exactly, Charlie. And what does the COVID crisis have to do with that in terms of the long-term impact we are seeing? So, thank you, Harold, and pleasure to be here. The UNEP emissions gap report, which is released annually by UNEP, shows that we remain locked on a path of very rapid global warming. Despite a brief dip in carbon dioxide emissions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, world is still heading for a temperature rise in excess of three degrees centigrade, and this is far beyond the Paris Agreement goals. Global GHG emissions have been rising at an average of 1.3% per year since 2020, including those from land use change. And over the last decade, the top four emitters, which are China, the US, the EU with the UK and India, have contributed 55% of GHG emissions. And whilst GHG emissions are starting to fall in OECD countries overall, given resource efficiency improvements 
and growth in low carbon energy source sources, they're continuing to rise in developing countries. This is because energy use is growing there. And whilst there's been some improvement in energy efficiency and some shift to lower carbon sources, this has not offset these rises. Hey, thanks, Charlie, for also for pointing out, I think, the important difference in, in the trajectories between emerging economies and established ones. Um, and I want to go a little bit deeper here and, so to say, beyond the numbers and take a little bit of journey from the heads to the heart and bring the conversation now to Zenat on the ground. In India, you work with local communities all around uh, the subcontinent. And what are you actually observing if we would see a three-degree warming scenario vis-a-vis -a, -vis a 1.51? What is the danger these communities are being uh, put in? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harold. And uh, at the outset, it's great to be back at the WCF uh, and its new avatar. Uh, you know, if, if we look at this uh, question of what we are seeing already, I think already at 1.5 degrees, the situation is quite, quite difficult and challenging. Uh, we are, uh, are uh, 1.5 degrees globally means about two degrees in our uh, hill regions, uh, if Uttarakhand and Himachal, for example. Uh, but let me give you a few examples of, of the kind of shifts and changes that we are seeing, you know, between October 2020 and the first week of April this year, 2021, we had over 980 forest fires in Uttarakhand. Why do these forest fires happen? Because you have uh, very, very scanty winter rains, which are decreasing. You also have uh, a drier March, April. And so, you know, within, in fact, this year, the first week of April, there were 20, 48 forest fires in the first 24 hours. So you can see the scale. Uh, the farmers in the Himachal Pradesh region, uh, those who are doing apple uh, farming and orchards, they're all going uphill. Uh, orchards are actually becoming unviable. The farmer, small farmer in the central Indian region, in fact, is suffering uh, losses of his uh, crop in the monsoon now almost every second year. We used to have drought cycles maybe once in 10 years, about two decades back, and these have become almost every alternate year. The woman in Rajasthan, the western part of Rajasthan, uh, you you see her walking further and further to get water. You see her having fewer and fewer days in which she can actually bathe because water sources are going. And yet there are flash floods, you know, within the year washing away her house. You have uh, the cities in the cent uh, central and western part of the country where temperatures are already going to about 50 degrees Celsius in the summers. And so there are fatalities for construction workers, for vegetable sellers, for policemen on duty. Uh, you can see these devastating impacts. And frankly, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If it goes to 3%, we are going to have an exploding situation. The coastline, we, are, we have a huge coastline absolutely exposed uh, where cyclones are increasing and the land is being gobbled up by sea level rise. So we are going to see migrants from the site. Uh, uh, from our, uh, our coastline into the central area. We are going to have migrants, climate migrants and refugees from the hills down to the plain area and, of course, across the borders as well. So this is going to be devastating. And at three degrees rise, I think we, we will probably start seeing situations which are even more dangerous, which is social strife. And I think before climate kills us, we will kill ourselves. Uh, and... Um, Unless global emissions really stem down drastically and we have strong adaptation measures in parallel, this is a, this is a very, very scary situation. Yeah, I think uh, we all feel with your social strife and an exploding situation with a different scenario. That's why it's so important to have this reminder that we can do something. And to fill this gap, Kenichi, uh, your organization is obviously uh, very active in this. What is and can be done uh, to work towards this 1.5 degree scenario and what needs to be prioritized? Yes, Harald, many things. But basically, we need to transform our production and the consumption patterns. The question we need to address is uh, what kind of product we produce, such as food, buildings, and energy, how much, how we produce, and where. 
And circular economy provides a valuable perspective to reduce emissions across sectors, ranging from energy supply, buildings, transport, agriculture, food, waste management, and industry of different kinds. And we need to take actions now while keeping in mind long-term goals to achieve the goal of Paris Agreement. Otherwise, we will end up in locked in high emission systems. The buildings infrastructure we build today will remain prints until mid-century. And durable goods such as cow will be used more than a decade. We need to accelerate actions on the ground now through our day-to-day -day work and decision, which will lead to more ambitious indices. Back to you, Herald. Thanks, Kenichi. Yeah, that's a, a short reality check at the beginning of this session about global warming and what's happening. Uh, and we all know the problem. We often hear it every single day. So it's good to restate it. And at the same time, uh, let us also reverse an imbalance I'm sometimes struck by. Namely, that we are focusing often 70% of the time on the analysis of the problem and only 30% on the solution. Let us reverse at least this today in our panel and remind us of the 30% uh, leave the problem in the 30% and focus on the solution in the remainder majority of the time. And we all have to admit this is complicated enough and it's possible to reach our climate goals. I personally have found the circular economy in the last years as a very powerful framework to get into action fast. And integrating circular approaches in national climate action plans can indeed help us to reach climate neutrality by 2050. This needs policymakers to shape now the frameworks of action, business leaders to commit to leadership and civil society and ask consumers to support this. Nearly 50% of global emissions are related to the production and consumption, as Kenichi also said, of products we use daily and the material used to make these products this needs to be limited. And my colleague Janusz Potocznik of the International Resource Panel explained this also very eloquently yesterday. How it is possible and what's needed. Let us have a look. According to IRP estimates, without drastic changes, global resource consumption is predicted to double by 2060. There is no way to decarbonize all the production in time and without massive trade-offs. Therefore, the only chance for reaching uh, our 2030 and 2050 climate and other environmental goals is to deploy all measures possible to prevent this development. This means reducing the need for new materials as much as we can, while of course taking into account that those countries in need of developing, uh, of, of developing in particular their basic infrastructure still needs to increase their use. In the IRP, we see an essential conceptual and policy approach in so-called decoupling, decoupling growth of human well-being and prosperity from natural resource use and environmental impacts. In high-income countries, due to the high level of consumption footprints, we would need to reduce resource use in absolute terms. For most of the lower-income countries, it would mean that resource use would need to be slower comparing to the growth of well-being and prosperity. We call that relative decoupling. The reason is mostly linked to the still missing essential infrastructure needs, as mentioned before. Decoupling is thus important for all the countries. So in short, reaching the same purpose with the products and services we know, while using less material and reaching more well-being and a more and just and better environment for our citizen. Now that all sounds like a bit of magic wand, and it is what the circular economy promises to be able to deliver. It's an opportunity. Uh, and it's an opportunity for all kinds of countries, developed and developing and emerging nations. And well-being, that is what we have today, but we need to redefine it in a different use of our products and services. So circular strategies are one powerful way to do this, and we need to implement them faster. And I want to turn on to Rob, uh, bringing you in here. We hear what the problem is that there are solutions we also know. And the question now is how we can help countries to adopt the solutions faster. Your organization works with over 60 countries. Can you give some examples how this is happening in collaboration with the countries? 
Thank you, Harold, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Um, so first, a very quick word on the NDC partnership. So we um, are a coalition of now around 114 member countries and uh, almost uh, 80 international organizations. Uh, and we work to support countries well, in accelerating well. the implementation of their, of their national climate plans and of enhancing ambition over time. Uh, we're currently supporting 65 countries through the process of raising the ambition uh, of their climate action uh, through their new NDCs. Um, now, the good news is that they are raising ambition. Of the countries that we're supporting, around 25 have now submitted their new or revised NDC. Um, all of those pretty much have raised ambition in one way or another, uh, with incre increased mitigation activity, uh, more robust uh, planning, uh, uh, adaptation activity. Um, now, to your question, is the circular economy a big part of that? Uh, the answer is not yet. Um, we are, um, we're not seeing countries um, frame their ambition specifically really in terms of circular economy activities. We are seeing them look at related questions. So um, to, uh, to take an example, Colombia, for instance, has an ambitious um, set of activities aimed at cutting their emissions uh, by 51% by the end of this decade compared to a, a business as usual trajectory. Um, and it's broken that out into different sectoral activities. Um, so a big part of it, for instance, is about address, uh, addressing deforestation and, and forest degradation. Um, that involves managing waste cycles much more efficiently. So if we're looking at the kinds of things that, that make up the circular economy, they're there, but they're not being framed in circular economy terms for the most part. How is it framed then? Is it framed as green recovery? And is this posing a problem if the framing is not clear? Um, it doesn't necessarily pose a problem. Um, it's being framed sometimes as waste management questions. Certainly countries are very focused on economic recovery. And, and in fact, we're, we are just in the process of deploying uh, over 50 economic advisors to uh, ministries of finance in, in around 35 countries so that they can align their NDC action with economic recovery. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, I'll perhaps come back to some other examples in, in, in a moment, very few where the circular economy concept is explicitly what the government is, uh, is using. Thanks, Rob. And now we bring in uh, Gloria. Nice to see you too. Um, UNDP is supporting over 100 countries to increase their climate ambitions through the climate promise. Can you give us some examples because you reported also that the circular economy is coming back more as a way to create more action. Thank you, Harad, and thank you for the, uh, thank you the organizers of the event. Um, so UNDP is supporting countries to identify circular opportunities in key areas of climate action to increase ambition. And I just want to give you a few examples of the countries we've supported and how they are doing this. In Vanuatu, for example, circular economy assessments have helped to identify opportunities that could reduce emissions by 44% with the inclusion of non-livestock sectors by 2030. And this included converting grasslands to silvopastoral livestock, which is basically looking at the combination of forests and, and livestock grazing and applying anaerobic digestion for municipal, industrial, and agriculture organic wastes. And in the Gambia, uh, in the agriculture sector, for example, resource extraction and organic waste have been identified as key priority areas for circular action, as they account for 57% of the national emissions. And in Lao PDR, we've held circular economy workshops to raise awareness in the public and private sector about the opportunities on circular economy. And this awareness raising is important as many actions are circular by nature, but are not identified as such. So there is a need to connect the dots between circularity and ambition and highlight these linkages for all the actors. Thanks, Gloria. Now we see a lot of action, that's good. Achim Steiner also said it before in the clip, more needs to be done. Uh, where would you see, or where are you pushing countries to take more actions? In which, uh, can you give some examples? I'm not, did you hear me, Gloria? 
Maybe not. Huh? Sir, yes, I beg your pardon, Harry. Uh, sorry, I was asking a follow-up question. Where you are pushing yes. countries to move faster yes. on circular economy and climate ambition? If you could give an example. Yes, so um, within the Climate Promise Initiative, um, I'd like to say that we are supporting countries to um, move forward to support countries realize their circular economy strategies in the revised NDCs. And in the context of countries, for instance, Uganda, um, we, there is a need to support the implementation of all these different actions to ensure that there is, for instance, access to finance, engaging the private sector and financial institutions within um, to, to come together to support circular, circularity and implementation of actions in different sectors. But also we see that there is a need to provide the right financial incentives of circularity, engaging governments to create the right policy environment, to engage companies to design products that retain their value and recover of materials as secondary feedstock. So um, as UNDP, we, we believe that these issues are very crucial and this can be done um, through tax policies that favor remanufactured goods, reducing taxes on, on recycled products and putting in place the right policy incentives to enable private sector um, involvement in the implementation of these actions. Thanks, Gloria. Um, Senat, to you, policy priorities, action plans, sector strategies, some of this sounds always very high level to all of us. Uh, you work with the communities. Um, how do the communities react to this? And what needs to happen there more of? Thanks, Harold, for the question. Um, you know that we are, um, we, we are actually bridging two things. We are bridging the, the need to meet our climate goals, but we are also bridging the need to meet our basic needs. Uh, we are rapidly urbanizing. There is a huge demand for materials, for, uh, mm. for water, for energy. And, uh, you know, so the, the solutions and the response that we have with our communities on the ground, they basically uh, center around what we've called local green enterprises. These are, or LGEs as we call them, these are uh, micro and small businesses. They're, they may be independent, they may be aggregated, group-based at the community level, village level, municipality level, but they work across different sectors. Very, very interestingly, across very high material intensive sectors like construction. And uh, it's, it's here where they are able to A, bring secondary resources uh, and what, what we call rematerialize, bring these resources back into the production area, supply uh, green materials for affordable housing, for example, and save, save carbon um, in the meantime. And I'll give you a few examples. We work with hundreds of uh, micro entrepreneurs who use fly ash and pond ash. These are wastes from the thermal power plants and they make bricks. Um, they, we also work with entrepreneurs who are uh, converting construction debris from the cities that are growing or the slag from the steel plants um, and iron plants into urban infrastructure like uh, pavements, like urban furniture. We're working with community groups who are converting farmyard wastes into composts for improving soil quality or textile waste into paper or pet bottles into textiles. So you see a whole lot of cross-sectoral integration happening through small entrepreneurs. Uh, we are now expanding our community-based enterprises to start looking at a wastewater management systems that, you know, that not only will bring back fresh water into the system, but video also uh, bring back the nutrients uh, in, into the system. And so in all of these, these are community answers, I think, to the global problem. Action has to happen on the ground, and that's where that's where they are, and they pro provide us tremendous local economy benefits, which is again a need of of our country. And our work involves supporting these enterprises with technology, with information, with skills, and also building a case for them uh, in in the in the hi-fi policy space, um, so that there is policy and market conditions that enable them to thrive. Uh, few numbers i think would be useful at this point uh, because you know when we talk about small medium enterprises community based initiatives you think that these are like small little uh, mickey mouse stuff happening 
uh, in, in different corners of the country. But, you know, just our own work, and we are a small part in this whole sector. We have over uh, 10,000 small and medium enterprises in the green construction sector that generate over 7 million US dollars worth revenues annually. Most of it is accrued locally. And Thank these you. are saving about 100,000 uh, tons worth CO2 uh, annually. CO2 emissions annually, and they are saving over 50,000 tons of topsoil because we are we are not no longer, you know, eating up the topsoil to make bricks. They utilize about 100,000 tons of industrial and municipal waste, bringing it back, rematerializing. Each of these enterprises, you know, it gives you a, gives about five to ten direct jobs. It gives about 15 to 20 indirect jobs, and many of them are led by women. So you Thank can you. see that there are social and environmental benefits along with the local economy benefits that we see here. Thank you, Senat. Can we show a short clip about uh, what the work is being done with these local communities? A women's self-help group is running a profitable livelihood enterprise based on the concept of creating wealth from waste. They have been trained to make bricks out of the highly polluting fly ash generated from a nearby thermal power plant. Using fly ash for making bricks is a great way to mitigate climate change, utilize industrial waste, save natural resources like soil, and promote job creation. So thank, thanks, I want to bring in some questions from, uh, from the audience here. One is to Rob, uh, to you. Looking at the NDC partnership members, uh, China and Russia are notably absent. That's what Marion is saying. How do we accomplish our global goals, she's asking, with major governments not raising yet their ambitions in line with what is needed? Rob. Sure. So, um, yes, not every country in the world is, uh, is part of the partnership. Uh, that doesn't, uh, of course, mean that they're not interested in taking action. Um, countries are going to go about this uh, in different ways. Um, we're clearly not yet at the stage we need to be in terms of, of our collective action and more is needed from all sides. What we want to make sure on the partnership side is that while everyone is focused on these major economies, and, and rightly so, um, that we're not forgetting that there are you know, a couple of hundred other countries that also need to be empowered to take action, um, partly because, of course, they could be the big emitters of tomorrow as they develop, uh, but, of, but of course, mainly because it's so important to uh, allow their people to have a prosperous future based on a low carbon and resilient development pathway. Thanks. And uh, Kenichi, maybe briefly to you, a question from Sarah. We have known for years, and I think that's what many of asking uh, ourselves, that we need to do more to combat cl uh, global climate change. Still, as we are just hearing this morning, countries do not commit to what's needed. We're in the run-up to COP26 in November. Why is that? Different reasons, depending on the nature of the countries. But clearly, it takes some time to learn and adapt immediate action to reduce emissions from different kinds of sectors. For example, renewable energies, how to build energy efficient buildings, how to change the private finance to be more green. So these kind of things yeah, may take some time, but I hope the countries around the world can learn each other to push forward for more higher ambition targets and actions. Thank you. Thanks, Kenichi. A lot of work to be done here. And I want to bring it back to some art and to capturing our insights so far. Vera, what are you observing? What are we seeing on your emerging image? All right, so uh, a lot <laughs> already. Nice. Um, I've, I've drawn on the left side of this uh, the climate change now, so the actual situation in which we zoomed in a little bit in the beginning. Um, also, because you said uh, very, uh, very right, I think. Let's not focus on it, but it has to be mentioned. I, I almost like took the percentage that you mentioned uh, in the drawing uh, and uh, showed it here on the left. So you can see the emissions, um, uh, the emissions gap. Uh, we talked about what does it do now to the environment, so the storms, fires, flooding and drought. I drew uh, a farmer who's also, also socially and in his work uh, affected by it. And now we are uh, just going to the right side, focusing on what can we do. The solutions will end up here uh, at the end of today. And here you can already see what we talked about, like the small business and communities. 
uh, the gender equality that also connects to this. And in the middle, of course, the, the circular sign. Um, also, uh, the small contribution uh, of how to frame it. Uh, I drew that as well. So uh, now we're working towards the, the right side of the drawing and eventually to what can we do? Yeah, I think it's very nice to, to circle in the middle and reminding of our friend Kate Raworth too, to have the balance between social needs yeah. and what is economically possible. And thanks, we're going to look, turn back to you a bit later to see Great. what's emerging. Yeah. I hope a clear agenda for change. Um, and so back to everybody, we have now established a bit the urgency what this transition is needed and that currently only 8.6% of the global economy are circular. So that's really less than 10%. And on the other hand, that leaves this huge opportunity to improve. And as we are speaking about ramping up our ambition and strengthening action, it is often the voice of the youth all around the world that has in the recent weeks also reminded us that we have to do much more and faster. And that's not only Greta Thunberg who suggested recently to move this year's climate summit so that everybody can be part. It's a global movement. And here at WCF, we had the pleasure to have a discussion with climate activists this morning. They came from the We Are Tomorrow Global Partnership, and we asked them about what they feel is most important about circularity and climate action. My dream scenario is a fair and equal world. So I think climate change and circular economy plays a key role in that because we need a planet without climate change or climate crisis. And for sure, circular economy is one of the solutions for that. I think we need more and, and diverse people working for this, uh, more, politi more politics, which are more women, more indigenous people, more young people too. So with that, with this, we can we can fight to this problem. We as Mexican youths, we need more funding for our projects. We need more more spaces so our voices can be heard. We need more opportunities of professionalization so that we can get new skills to to take climate action in our own territories. And also, we need to be certain that our just transition is going to be promoted. We need to start moving away urgently from top-down solutions that are created according to some universal notions of what progress looks like or how problems must be solved, and rather focus on um, creating participative and deliberative spaces for local communities and giving them the assistance, the funds, the support, so that they can then co-create and implement the solutions that are needed to avoid the climate crisis. And I think what I need from these actors is basically the, the necessary support, um, the capacity building, and the trust in localized solutions and giving them access to experts, policymakers, and so on, so that we can really um, combine this scientific progress with local traditional wisdom. Yeah, it's great to see how this future is painted. The future has to happen now. I want to turn back to you, Charlie. Um, are we hearing enough of these young activists? You have been one of them just some years ago. <laughs> some considerable years ago, actually, Harold. But yes, given that an intact environment and a stable climate is even more important to youth than it is to the older among us, we definitely still need to hear more from youth. I, I have to say I'm very mm -hmm. encouraged, though, about how the voice of youth has risen in the last few years and how it's being heard in higher and higher places. The messages coming from youth come with strength, commitment, fresh insights, and I'm frankly a real moral authority on the urgency of the environmental and climate crisis. Um, in UNEP, we have a project called the Anatomy of Action, which is promoting sustainable lifestyle challenges and a particular fo focus on youth-centered processes and, and groups. Working with universities and youth groups on specific events and, and webinars to support sustainable lifestyles in language that's easy to understand and to promote changes in what we eat, how we move, how we live, how we spend our leisure time. Uh, as part of that, there's been a sustainable lifestyle, a sustainable lifestyle challenge, which has reached more than 
4 million people, notably through Instagram, resulting in thousands of media posts uh, and creating a global mosaic of people, many of them young, to live more sustainably. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we all find ourselves in panels, working groups, where there's no youth involvement. Rob, from your experience, how can we include youth much more systematically in our work? Yes, thanks. This is a, a huge um, uh, priority for the NDC partnership. Uh, and in fact, at the end of last year, uh, the partnership adopted what, what was called a youth engagement plan. And I'm happy to say that the Netherlands was one of the uh, strongest advocates for that plan. Um, we, uh, we basically um, envisage engaging youth in four main ways um, for our work. Um, first is supporting countries to design youth in inclusive processes for designing and implementing their NDCs. That's to understand how young people are impacted, yes, but also crucially to benefit from their creative inputs uh, for the solutions. Uh, the second piece is to support the development of youth-led uh, NDC implementation projects. Uh, we just heard in the video from the Mexican youth representative uh, how important it is and how difficult it is to get funding for projects that are driven by young people. Um, the third is to build up the capacity of, of young people to engage in climate change activity, whether that's at the international level or I would say even more importantly uh, in countries um, on the implementation side. Uh, and then fourth is the strategic level input from youth. Uh, in our case, that means um, convening young people to get strategic messages to our steering committee so that we know that the partnerships work as a whole uh, is driven in direction that reflects the concerns that young people are bringing. Yeah, I think I, I, I personally hope that this is becoming a really a, a transgenerational topic. You know, we need all generations in this climate ambition effort that we are seeing. And Gloria, back to Africa, youth, a big topic there, obviously. And in the region where you're working in and around Uganda, how is youth involvement being prioritized in the next gen climate plans? Thank you, Harold. Um, I, I want to start by saying that UNDP's climate promise ensures that country ownership and inclusive, inclusiveness are the heart of the NDC revision process. And in many countries, UNDP has helped governments to facilitate consultations with various youth groups, as well as civil society organizations and indigenous communities. I'll give an example in North Macedonia, for example, uh, recommended actions from a survey on engaging youth in NDCs has been incorporated in the revised NDCs of the country. But specifically looking at um, Uganda and other developed countries. Um, in the context of Uganda, UNDP has supported the youth with small grants. We call them the Climate Action Grants, where youth are able to implement uh, projects in renewable energy, in waste management, in, in agriculture, and others, which are related to circularity. We've also come up with a youth for business facility that is really helping the implementation of these youth-led projects. Uh, a concrete example I want to give you is a youth organization we've supported. It's called Your West, that has designed a location mobile-based app uh, to improve municipal solid waste collection service delivery in most of the urban centers. As you know, most of the waste is from the urban centers. So, so through this mobile app, um, the, it's able to connect the garbage generators, the households, uh, the companies, the industries, to the nearest garbage um, co collectors within their vicinity. Uh, within their vicinity. So we see that such youth-led initiatives should be upscaled and they can create impact. And through these um, initiatives, the private sector, the government needs to support concrete uh, youth-led initiatives to amplify the voice of circularity and to, imp to implement um, circular economic uh, principles and strategies across the different sectors. Yeah, circular economy is certainly an opportunity to amplify the voice of youth. Um, and Zainat, in India, it's an emerging economy, a giant, and people want to go for the economic opportunities that they see, obviously, and that many of us fear uh, globally that the climate then becomes kind of a second choice. And speaking to you, these debates can come hopefully much more together. Um, and what's your experience? Can the young people thrive in a low carbon 
circular economy, or is this sometimes seen as a limiting factor? What are you seeing on the ground? Uh, thanks, Adil. I think um, the short answer is yes. But uh, let me just elaborate. You know, in order for the young people to thrive, uh, I mean, in countries like India, we need uh, economic opportunities, livelihood options, decent jobs, purposeful jobs that bring both the social, environmental and the economic agenda together that enable them to access basic needs for a decent lifestyle. And this is not a simple matter for some countries like us because we are a young country. I mean, we are uh, over 50 percent of our young people are below the age of 25, over 65 percent below the age of 35. This is prime working age. And yet our unemployment rate is 7.1 percent in the January in January 2020. It's huge. Uh, the joblessness has hit the youth and amongst the youth, the y women and girls much more. So what do we do? You know, where we, we are seeing a situation where in the villages, farms are no longer able to support young people for for their livelihoods and industries are no longer able to absorb them in jobs. And, there are no jobs around and therefore our focus has been on entrepreneurship and here is where we work with young people to co-create uh, enterprise solutions and i was so happy to hear you know the desire from our young champions in the film that you showed uh, that you know it's about inclusion it's about participation and designing these solutions together both at the farm level as well as at the off farm level we are creating clusters of what we call uh, local enterprise coalitions these are local area um, coalitions which bring together young people along with their uh, banking institutions, with their other skill support institutions to, to create a local environment for, for enterprise. Uh, and we are aggregating these enterprises for better access to markets, also for better access to credit, uh, credit services. We are also, you know, in some of the very new interesting public sector initiatives, the government initiatives in the country for skilling, for green job opportunities. Um, you know, we are we are connecting them, like, for example, in our tourist uh, tourism in um, uh, groups, we are connecting them to ecotourism startups. So there is a private sector of different scale that is being connected to as well as the public sector. And uh, what we see is a huge pot potential for thriving. I mean, the hope amongst the youth and their enthusiasm and the opportunities in the circular economy space. Thank These, you. Thank you, Senator. Along with the opportunities in the tech arena, the internet, this brings us together. I Th think Thank you, Senat. what they now need is market creation. Thank you. I think you, thank you. You, you, you point to a good fact. Technology is a very nice enabler, also for circular economy. Circular tourism you are speaking about, I think it nicely shows the different uh, responsibilities for the people who are coming and the people who are living there. So it's a really a balanced approach. And I want to pick up one question from the audience for Charlie, um, uh, talking about the work with governments. How can you sh ensure and support that countries are prioritizing um, the opportunities for GHG emission reduction correctly so that the right measures are set in the areas where you can get the most traction fast with limited resources? Thank you for that, uh, Harold, and the member of the audience. Um, we're, we're working with governments to help them determine which are the most carbon intensive and GHG emitting sectors in their economy. We have a tool which I'm going to talk about later, which we're deploying together with UNDP called the SCP Hotspots Analysis Tool. And this tells you where the biggest problem is in your economy which sectors in which you need the most, more material efficiency, more recycling. And it's a science-based tool, and we're finding a lot of interest um, among a, a large number of governments as they, as they pick this up. And having that starting point is enabling uh, governments, for example, to pick up the infrastructure sector, which is one of the I'm most sure carbon do. intensive. Um, I mean, agriculture and construction between them account for approximately 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And this is often overlooked. You, there are a lot of low-hanging fruit and very large low-hanging fruit in those sectors. And so this science base for 
an entry level assessment tool for governments is really vital in ensuring prior the correct prioritization and large uh, emission reduction gains that are possible in those sectors that will actually be picked up by governments which are currently being missed. Thanks, Charlie. I think you have talked about a very important tool uh, that you guys have been developed around sustainable consumption production. Can we play that video now briefly? Countries need data that are easy to access and understand on natural resource use and other major environmental impacts across their economies to know where to focus their efforts. The SCP hat analyzes the environmental and socioeconomic performance of 171 countries over the last 25 years, offering empirical evidence of hotspots, of unsustainable consumption and production practices, and tracing environmental pressures and impacts along the value chain of goods and services consumed in each country. The SCP hat is informing the design of science-based policies in countries. UNEP and UNDP are jointly applying SCP hat data in the revision of NDCs. Visit the SCP hat and start exploring country-level data and uncovering hotspots for sustainable consumption and production. Thanks for the clip, uh, Charlie and your team. I, we all need to act fast and we have to act now. And it's a mutual journey of learning and support. So I want to turn back to Gloria, um, because in the Global South, we have been, um, the Global South has been applying many circular economy solutions already for a long time, maybe even for centuries. And some of this wisdom, it's sometimes lost. So the question to you, how can the rest of the world make this a mutual learning journey and benefit from that old wisdom? Yeah, thank you, Harold. Um, I like to start by saying that it is important to recognize that the concept of circular economy is climbing up in the political agenda, especially in the global north, but circularity has been implemented for centuries, especially in developing countries, in African countries. It has been implemented by indigenous peoples, by local communities. So there is need to look at this traditional knowledge that has existed, that has been implemented for so long, to learn how these solutions can be applied to today's prob problems on mitigation and adaptation. In agriculture and food processing, for example, in many African countries, organic residues are collected, whether from agriculture or industries or households, and are used to regenerate soils as manure. They are used to make food, new food products, or they even provide alternative packaging materials. An example I want to give you here is in the context of Uganda, we have a company called Oribags that goes to different industries to collect paper waste, uh, all, sites, all sorts of waste, and converts this waste into bags, into um, a number of materials, bags, uh, shoes. So you find that such uh, circular economy principles should also be applied to other sectors in industry, in, in construction, in manufacturing. We need to amplify these practical solutions and ensure that this knowledge is captured and fed into the NDC processes. And we need to ensure that it's replicated and scaled up in different countries and across the region. So there is a need to share knowledge, share best practices, to ensure that different solutions can be upscaled and replicated in different countries across the globe and in different regions. Thanks, Thank Gloria. You. Need for upscaling, absolutely. We're all with it. Rob, very short 30 second response. What's the biggest obstacle of countries that you are facing when we and everybody's telling them, please do more of that? I, yeah, I think building off Gloria's point, um, in a word, finance. Um, so there are um, countries are bringing forward actions based on, on traditional ways of doing things, sometimes on, on new ideas. Um, just to point to one example, um, Jordan has uh, presented requests to us around uh, um, enhancing its circular economy with um, things like construction of wastewater uh, activities, uh, reduction of food waste, development of biogas, rehabilitation of landfills, for instance. Um, we still haven't got that fully funded. Um, there's an enormous financing gap. We are helping countries like uh, Sao Tome, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia to present investment plans. Uh, countries like Rwanda are pioneering green funds with the support of, of the World Bank and UNDP, amongst others. Um, and so we're seeing some really interesting ideas. We're seeing a lot of innovation uh, on the countryside. But the scale of finance that's needed in order to empower those countries to, uh, to turn all of that into the kinds of projects that, that you can really touch and, and feel on the ground, 
um, is still is still not there, and it's an enormous challenge mobilizing it. Thanks, Rob. Let's rise together up to the challenge, the challenge of an empty uh, room here. It's nice to be here again with you, Vera. Um, and can you please synthesize a bit what you have been seeing? I see some nature coming back, also from red alert to maybe a yeah. green way forward. Well, uh, yeah, you, you see it uh, exactly the right way, and it was nice to keep you company in this empty studio uh, as well. Um, so, so this is what I did with the colors. You see the, the reddish uh, pink color uh, uh, on the top and some uh, drastically melting icebergs. And, and the, uh, down below, I drew the, the coral reefs uh, re-blooming and a, a happy turtle. Um, uh, and this is actually the, the part that, that we ended on. What can we do? What are the concrete things that we can do together? Um, involve youth more, I think, is a very important first step that I heard um, uh, people talk about as well. And the youth is speaking up. Uh, obviously, we saw the film, uh, but they need to speak up more. And, uh, uh, well, that's an invitation, I think. Uh, the the top-down old models, I threw them in the bin right here. I drew another one uh, that ki that's kind of similar, but that's like the pyramid of, of security. So it's also important to uh, put that social security and, and j uh, jobs and, uh, uh, well, the things you need to live first for young people so they can uh, join the climate movement as well. Um, the intermediate goals, so I drew, I, I usually draw a a target for, uh, for a bow and arrow uh, for goals. Uh, and I drew an apple in the middle, that's a 2030 apple. So when, before you reach the 2050 goal, uh, make sure to set a good intermediate goal. Uh, the focus on the local communities, we already talked about that. Um, the great tool that was just mentioned, the SCP, SCP hat tool and, and maybe others to determine your first steps and focus areas in your climate agendas. And last of all, uh, and, and probably overall uh, share knowledge together as we do today i think I, I drew a north and south globe here as well so worldwide knowledge sharing and uh, keeping each other involved sums it up <laughs> hey, thanks so much and i hope this will be available for all of us uh, at this in social media of the wcf please print it put it into your living rooms as a reminder of a very important <laughs> session a nice summary couldn't have uh, summarized it better and it brings us unfortunately to an end of a super challenging conversation this morning, a super rich one also, um, because on the one hand, we have to raise climate ambition. That's clear. And the fact that countries and climate plans are still falling short of this ambition, we also know. And we have discussed what can be done and that there's a lot happening on the ground and more support is needed from learning together to finances. And really, I want to recognize the people that today were on the panel as individuals as much as organizations, because they represent uh, this hope that we can give to the world. And I know that it's also the personal missions to really advance this activity. So thank you all for your commitment and effort. We absolutely need more of this. At the end of the panel, we want to be brief. The COP26 climate ambition challenge and negotiations are coming up in November. And one of the most important negotiations, maybe in history, Asking 30 seconds, because I believe we have two more minutes from each of the panelists. Truly keep to 30 seconds, please. What's your commitment to make sure that ambitious climate plans will happen and that circular economy strategies are implemented in that? Gloria. Uh, thank you, Harry. Um, so um, I want to pledge that UNDP will continue its support through the climate promise to ensure that countries identify entry points for circular economy within their NDCs. Um, by helping include circular economy strategies and policies as part of the country's revised NDCs, UNDP will help to countries to achieve this transformational change that we've been talking about since yesterday that is necessary to decarb decarbonize the economies, including positive society-wide uh, benefits and the transformational change that we want to see that will amplify the voices of the marginalized groups in the global south that have traditional knowledge, that have these solutions that need to be captured in the national and global processes. And I also want to say that UNDP will continue to work with different uh, UN agencies, UNEP, UNIDA, UNEP, UNEP, and other partners to support countries in the global south to develop and implement circular solutions. Thank that you, Gloria. Address we have the 30 seconds crisis. left, so I have to interrupt you, unfortunately. Unfortunately, be a bit rude. Over to Charlie, please. What is your 30-second commitment? 
So we will continue with our work on SCP and circular economy uh, in injecting it into circular economy action plans. We will we will help on policy coherence, not and prioritization, not just with SCP hat, but looking to scale up uh, what's already happening on the ground. I mean, it was very striking what Zenat, Zenat spoke about. It was very clear and coherent and substantive vision of a circular economy built by local actors. We need to bring those small scale models up to national and regional and global levels. And Thank we, you, we commit to doing that. Thanks, Charlie. Sinat, over to you. Short, please. Very quickly, I think. Our, our, um, at our end, we will do the following, you know, continue to build evidence through our models that these models work. Second, continue to communicate this evidence to the policymakers so that they can support the upscaling. Third point, to not just get this communication out and the voice of the small entrepreneur, but also to get the small entrepreneur on the table for negotiation, for being the stakeholder in the transition. And finally, to facilitate the, the uh, partnership between the small entrepreneurs and the public agencies, the municipalities, etc., so that we can actually have a throbbing, dynamic uh, circular economy that provides for our, uh, our people as well as for the environment. Thanks, Sinat. Over to Kanichi from the UNFCCC. What's your commitment? We will continue to strengthen and mobilize our network to support policymakers and stakeholders we have a great platform for collaborations, so-called global climate actions, including actions by high-level champions and climate neutral initiatives and the market and the sectoral partnership, as well as the race to zero, where more than 1,600 companies joined the force. And I hope the audience can check our website by typing global climate action and they participate in your process. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to the wonderful team here. Thanks to Holland for hosting. Thanks, Vera, for being a wonderful co-moderator here. And please, uh, you uh, everywhere in the world, please, it's a very important year for climate action. We'd love to see your action and engagement. And thanks for joining us today.